The Athletic. The race is on, and it's a case of new year, new hope, as we can all start looking forward to another F1 season, one that will hopefully produce a more dramatic World Championship fight. I'm Ed Shaw, and joining me to pose the big questions of 2024, and even have a go at answering them, are Scott mitchell Malm and Glenn Freeman. Scott, welcome. Happy New Year. How are your celebrations? Yeah, Happy New Year. Happy to be here and recording definitely in 2024 at the very start of the new year. How about those lottery numbers last night? Uh, who would have thought that the number 20 would come up four times in the same lottery draw? That, that's, that was astonishing. Excellent. So did you win? Well, I didn't. Unfortunately, I didn't have that advanced knowledge. That It would have been really, really useful to have picked all of those numbers on my ticket. But unfor- maybe someone else will cash in instead. It's a, ver- it's a very specific choice for your generic uh, New Year celebrations, reflections. I had a very generic, vague New Year. It certainly happened. And I'm certainly uh, feeling the after effects of it. Glenn, how about you? I don't know why you two are trying to be so funny and vague. I had an early night on the 31st, so we could record this at the crack of dawn on New Year's Day. <laughs> Absolutely, in the middle of the night, pretty much, from the uh, from the release time. So, yeah, just in case anyone's wondering, it's definitely not December when we're recording this. We've definitely not got ahead, and we're definitely not currently probably asleep, for those of you who are listening to this shot. Hang on, hang on. There's, there's no way Scott and I are going to be asleep when this comes out. No, exactly. You might be, um, you know, completely free to just uh, live your life as you please, Ed, but unfortunately we've chosen to ruin ours <laughs> yeah well we probably should be clear we mean by having children <laughs> yeah i've got no childcare responsibilities fortunately that'll definitely be paying me off on uh, on new year's day and that's why you were on the town last night ed celebrating new year well as is my style of course as as is well known i'm famous for it so yeah that's why we're possibly getting ahead but i still think our, our salutations of happy new year are legitimate to all our listeners. Thanks for joining us for another year on the Race F1 podcast. And we are on this podcast going to look ahead to the 2024 F1 season. Seems the appropriate time to do it. We're going to tackle some of the big questions. Now, we won't have comprehensive answers to these questions, but we can explain why they're important and get our take based on the somewhat limited information we've got so far. So first up, question one, Scott. Will Red Bull's dominance continue? I really, really, really hope that the answer to this is either no or yes, but they'll. But it will be really hard fought. I, I, I can't express anything other than hope for that at the moment. I certainly don't have the expectation that it won't continue because one of the advantages that Red Bull had because of the the, the size of the, the the performance edge that it that it had early in 2023 but also the various problems that all of its rivals had is that it wasn't under pressure to develop hard in the first part of 2023 or even through 2023 and then therefore take away precious resource and time from from its 2024 work which was obviously from October 22 to October 23 much more of a pressing issue for Red Bull in light of the penalty that they got for breaking the budget cap back in 2021 with the further restrictions on what they could do with the wind tunnel and with the CFD testing allowances that they have so they almost got a little bit of a free pass from their rivals with that with that penalty and it just meant that well, it's, it's, it would be wrong to say that the RB19 was untouched through 2023. We, we we saw quite a few a few upgrades, but there just there wasn't the emphasis on improving that car, and it allowed them to get ahead effectively on the 2024 car. So I don't see why RB20 would be compromised in any way. I think RB20 will be an evolution and a very good evolution on on RB19, and unfortunately, that sets quite an ominous benchmark for Rebels rivals. Yeah, you always have to look for reasons why things might change. And as it's steady state, the trends are that Red Bull can just continue on its serene trajectory with its car concept and get some more performance out of it while others are having to change their direction. There's no reason in any of that to expect things to change for Red Bull. So perhaps, Glenn, you can try and find either some reason we haven't thought of or perhaps give a slightly watered down version of the question, which is, will Red Bull's dominance be at least lessened? It should be lessened. Um I nearly said this year, but of course it's now 2024. Uh, 2023 should be an anomaly in that it was Red Bull adding more layers of perfection to the best um, first attempt at these new rules that we had in 2022, whilst its two 
best, what should have been its two best place rivals, Mercedes and Ferrari, were still getting it wrong. So you had these great leaps from Aston Martin and McLaren, but they were coming from so far back that you couldn't expect any more of them. So the onus was on the other uh, two members of the big three and they dropped the ball. So as we'll come on to later, you've got to hope that they finally make some progress. But I've there's an interest. You talked about it being steady state. Ed, and I think that's really interesting because over this this winter, I've I've come to a realization that Max Verstappen's uh, three years of winning the world championship so far remind me of the start of Michael Schumacher's dominance with Ferrari. So the first year is uh, an epic title fight with kind of that driver's defining rival. So we had Verstappen versus Hamilton for that read. Uh, Schumacher versus Hacken and in 2000 then you had uh, Max's second title was you know the Red Bull was the best car and he, he did the best job and they got it wrapped up early but there was a bit of a challenge that was Schumacher in 2001 with kind of Williams and McLaren were snapping at Ferrari's heels sometimes then you had 2002 Ferrari and Schumacher obliterated everyone 2023 Verstappen and Red Bull obliterated everyone the difference is that steady state phrase because in 2002 f1 and that really means bernie eccleston panicked and he 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 forced through he got the fia to make loads of rule changes in conjunction with max mosley they, they came together max's attitude was more always kind of if you're doing the best job you deserve to win bernie's attitude was this is a show this is a business this is a tv product we've got to do something this time stefano domenicali who's in that role has held his nerve he is backing the other teams to close the gap without having to interfere. And he's been quite clear, hasn't he? I would say the last, you could probably say 12 months that he doesn't want F1 to intervene. So we're going to see if that pays off for him. He's I, he, he's gambling from the point of view of F1's priorities are that this is a successful business and TV ratings have gone down for the last two years. So it is a gamble and it's, it'll be very interesting to see if it pays off for him. I thought you were teeing up a prediction of a classic 2003-style season there, but you undercut it with your damned facts about the past. Yeah, sorry, everyone. Bring back V10's hat on. I was going to say, who's going to play the role of the win one race but somehow takes the title to the to the decider? And how much of an achievement would that be in a 24-race season? <laughs> it would take some going, wouldn't it? Especially with an old car, given that everybody's old cars last year were a bit rubbish. Yeah, exactly. I think one of the things that... And this actually this leads leads on from that steady state point that, that Ed made because one of the things that I felt was a bit disingenuous at the end of last year when Christian Horner spoke was um, he talked about 2021 and what happened to Mercedes being no guarantee of the dominance continuing because obviously Mercedes absolutely ran away with it in 2020 and then Lewis lost the the title to. Verstappen in 2021 and we had an absolute ding-dong fight from race one to, to the final round. That wasn't steady state. There's a massive difference between what happened between 2020 and 2021 and what's happening between now uh, between 2023 and 2024. And that difference is that there aren't a set of regulations basically designed to screw the dominant team over because that is a that was a massive factor in 2021. We had that quartet of small but significant changes which basically moved... Uh, I wouldn't say move the advantage away from, but it hurt cars like, and I say cars like, basically only the Mercedes and the Racing Point, which then became the Aston Martin, and massively favoured the high rate cars. So all of a sudden, yes, there had been progress at the end of 2020 and Red Bull had ended 2020 in a better position. That also hasn't happened now. They, they aren't under like, they aren't losing races now. But they were also then given a, a massive assistance with a significant, if small, set of rule changes, and that just isn't happening this year. So it's a it's a very significant it's a very significant difference. Don't don't get hoodwinked by any quotes you see saying, "Oh, well, we've seen it in the past." No, when nothing changes, why should anything change? So you, we really are putting the emphasis on the rivals having more to find than Red Bull tripping up over something or something holding them back. If people would like a glimmer of hope, there is one insofar as it's not necessarily the case that Red Bull has hit upon everything that's right and virtuous about these regulations. There might be some untapped concept that some other team can hit on. I feel like it's quite unlikely with how tight the regs are, but it's always possible. 
because we know, and we'll get onto this in a minute, other teams are changing their concepts and approach. So there's a, a possibility of that. I'd be quite surprised, but it's always a relative game, isn't it? And just because Red Bull have had the best car for the first two years of this regs doesn't necessarily mean it is the best possible car. And there's always some way to go. So that's the that's the hope, and that's what the other teams will be using to drive themselves on. And on which note, Glenn, let's talk about one of those teams. This big question is, can Mercedes get its car concept right? Well, um, I, it's got to be better than the last two years um, because I think they've cut. They have. They did come to that realization that the 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 route they were going down on their own was was wrong. I remember saying to somebody about this time last year, what we need is the Mercedes arrives in 2023 testing with big Red Bull style side pods on it and is rapid in testing and then we'll have a great season. It came out with no side pods, was still rubbish, was still bouncing. Lewis Hamilton still hated it and they, they were, you know, they paid the price for that all year. My concern, although they should go back in the right direction, my concern is you are asking them to get this version of the car right at the first attempt. And I find that unlikely. So I think it'll be better. But are we going to see them make, you know, are are they going to produce kind of what we saw McLaren do in the back half of last year, maybe, where they, on certain tracks and on its day, the Mercedes can be up there snapping at a Red Bull's heels. I think that's about the best they can hope for. James Allison has come back, but he's had a limited amount of time kind of pulling the strings again. And F1 car performance is is kind it's an oil tanker. It takes a long time to turn things around. You, you can't just click your fingers anymore and go, ah, we were doing it wrong. We know what we should have been doing. We fixed it. We're back at it. Um, again, McLaren is kind of your hope there, but they were coming from such a low base uh, whereas Mercedes, they, you know, they still they still finished second in the championship. Uh, but it was just that they never looked like winning a race. So that was the concern. I think they can be in the mix. I, I don't see, I, I don't have enough faith in them, unfortunately, under this rule set yet to believe that they're suddenly going to come out with a, a Red Bull beater or a Red Bull matcher. They should at least be able to be in the right direction, I would expect. Now, people, For the first time in this rule set. Well, that's the thing. People <laughs> make a nice say, change, oh, wouldn't it? Exactly. Well, people will say, hang on a minute. We were talking about this going into last year and they had the same concept. They didn't get it right. But there were some differences. I, or oh, This is going to be difficult in terms of time streams. I've written a piece, <laughs> which at the moment I'm speaking has not yet run, but almost certainly will have run by the time you hear this, that was based on a James Allison interview. And he basically said their big mistake was that they thought that their car, even at the end of 2022, their car concept with the bouncing and porpoising problem, not necessarily eliminated, but dramatically mitigated by the rule changes was enough. And they they ignored a lot of the feedback that drivers were giving them because they thought the first order problem was all of the bouncing and porpoising. But there were other problems beyond that. And it took this following season for them to learn that. So the Monaco change was was a big shift to change what they could within the limitations of the architecture of the car. Now, next year's car will have a, a different rear suspension, different gearbox to go with that, different monocoque shape. They'll probably move around the, the side impact protection. So there's some pretty big architectural changes. So when it comes to this question there's a good chance they will get the car concept right. But as you said, Glenn, that's not necessarily enough. So I feel like unless Mercedes does something absolutely remarkable, the answer to this question could be, well, yes, it will, but it won't be enough. This isn't meant to be an uncharitable question or misleading or anything like that, but it is, and it probably sounds quite naive, but is there a difference between them getting the car concept right and not getting it wrong? Uh, <laughs> I think we need a Venn diagram for this. That's well, tricky. Ultimately, well, well, you could, you could. Say, are you are you saying that getting the car concept right means getting it right and getting somewhere near maximising it, whereas not getting it wrong means being in the right direction but not all the way there? Is that the distinction? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I mean, if they take the side pods off again, they really have got it wrong. Although they will tell you that the side pods weren't a significant factor even later uh, on in the development of that car. But uh, that's by the by. Let's not go on to those. It's funny how they're not on the car anymore, isn't it? Well, they, they say that that took performance off the car when they did it. 
But I think the thing is they got a little bit hung up on these because people were saying they were the first order problem, the side pods, which they weren't. But the, no. the side pod shape and concept follows what you're doing with the underfloor. And again, the fact that they were standing alone and they've moved off it, I think probably says something. Yeah, so. they were getting lots of things wrong. That just happened to be the most visible difference. So we <laughs> and, all and perhaps, sort of clung to it. And perhaps a very trivial one, in fact. But I think we will see normal side pods or something approaching that anyway, as we saw for a lot of this year. The reason I sort of frame that question is that, you know, that difference between getting it right and not getting it wrong is that I I, I feel I'm very confident Mercedes won't get it entirely wrong. I don't I don't think they're going to turn up with something that looks so dramatically different and then f- falls at the first hurdle again. But it, it really does depend on what you mean by get get that car concept right. And I think because of this team's previous um, track records and the ambition and expectation of the team, get its car concept right has to mean fighting Red Bull. And this time 12 months ago, I was happy probably in this same podcast and certainly in other podcasts that we did before the start of the season and stuff that I'd written saying that, yeah, w- w- why shouldn't I believe that Mercedes will get it right? Because that organisation is fantastic. It's had amazing success. It's also succeeded across different rule sets. So it wasn't just it lucked into one really long cycle of rules or, or, or anything like that. They were talking really positively and optimistically. They did seem to have got to got a really good understanding of where things had gone wrong but then they went ahead and got it wrong again in a different way but and I understand I appreciate what Ed was saying there and and James Allison's explanation for it I I I get that there are reasons 2023 went wrong and and it sounds like very well understood reasons why 2023 got wrong but what happened across 22 and then into 23 does dent my confidence that they can eradicate all of those problems at the first go in 2024. You don't want to get duped again, do you? Your your faith was shaken last year. I I, I think I think what what Ed, you guys have said is right that you can get the car if, if they get the car concept right, as in they make the first step, but it's and it's the first of many steps. That's not enough for them. You look at the the rhetoric around Mercedes from the very top, from Toto Wolf throughout last year, really, but particularly at the end of last year, constantly banging on, but not shying away from it, but almost overdoing what a failure Mercedes have been so far. And that's created a bit of backlash where people are saying, come on, this is a bit much. Like you still finished second in the championship and you're talking like, you know, you've been down the back battling with those, uh, with a Williams or a Sauber or something like that. But that's because of what you guys said that, for Mercedes, Mercedes exists to be fighting for wins and championships. And second, in 2023, more than in any other year for a long time, I think, second place really was first of the losers. The Mercedes never, I know we had the odd race where you could have gone, oh, did Mercedes mess up their strategy? Could they have fought a bit harder for the win there? They were never really in the hunt for a win. They never turned up to a weekend where you could even say they had the equal fastest car. So for them... That is that is total failure. Yeah, and there's a test for the team there in terms of how well has it really responded to uh, that whole process. James Allison has also talked about there being a bit of, I think, fragmentation was the way he characterised it within the team, that when they were trying to recover, they all kind of redoubled their efforts, but almost you ended up focusing so much on your own little world in the park. Independently. Exactly, that it wasn't... It's a really good Exactly, yeah, that it wasn't sort of connected up, and that's been tackled, but... The really interesting thing is that if they do get the car concept right, let's let's say all the fundamentals are there, the direction is right, then it becomes a pure game of development. It's how quickly can you get that aero tracker line going up compared to your opposition. And then it's the question of do you properly do you properly understand the kind of aggregate of the characteristics you need to get. Because these cars are all about getting performance through a range of ride heights, and there's all sorts of trade-offs there that you have to apply. So it's a big test. Even if you get the fundamentals right, there is a question about do you really understand how to a- how to absolutely optimise this? That's a big test for Mercedes and a very interesting one. I think a good season for them would be right sort of concept, decent development path, Probably a few wins would be... If they did that, you'd think that that's all right. That's a decent season, good step. And if they were to do more than that and be a genuine title threat, you'd say, blimey, that's that's pretty impressive. Certainly possible, but would require a big step. And 
if they were to be in the wilderness again and lost that would be very very serious because you could kind of connect what happened last year to the year before because they hadn't quite realized the full extent of it but they know how wrong last year's car was they know the direction they need to go and if if they've gone off in a completely different direction that isn't right or not understood really the core things they're trying to achieve and it's very easy to create kind of a car that's a simulacrum of what it should be in that it yeah, looks you can a make like a bad a Red copy Bull. exactly you've got all the same things but you don't really understand the the, the formula that's generating that you, you've got your result but because you don't understand the working it's not really doing that and there's a lot of secrets there. so it's a big challenge i think mercedes mercedes you have to say should be given a fair amount of credit they're a very capable team, very good facilities, very good people. But it's a big test, isn't it, particularly when you're going up against Red Bull. Well, let's move on now to Ferrari, Scott. Is Vasseur's Ferrari on the path to glory? I think it's on a good path. Um, it's certainly... It's on a the bit path more... to something. Yeah, sure. It's, definitely... it's not on the path to oblivion, but is it's... it not on the path to glory? I want, I want to see the map. It's walking, definitely. For, it's, I don't know if it's a prancing horse at the moment, but it's definitely it's not limping as badly as it seemed to be at the end is of twenty twenty two. Is it trotting? <laughs> yeah, but I not think galloping? so. That's a good way. Of, yeah, I think so. It's trotting along. Will it? But will it break out into? I don't know. I guess a prance is an upgrade on a trot. It depends what you're trying to achieve, I suppose. Um, will I it think, give a win? A. <laughs> I think um, I I quite liked what I saw from. Fred's Ferrari in the second half of, of 2023. There was still still a few signs of the old uh, the old weaknesses remaining. Reliability, a couple of um, imperfectly run races and, and that kind of thing. But one, I liked the way Ferrari went about its 2023 in terms of solving some problems. I like the fact that they made actual technical progress with the car because I do think that has been a real weakness of that team in, in recent years, and they've brought stuff that just hasn't worked in the way that they wanted it to or, or needed it to. I quite like the way Fred d- does seem to be quite neatly immune to one of the worst things about Ferrari, which is just the insane levels of speculation and, and that kind of stuff. Like He has just so little interest in it. He's, so, he's always got disdain for speculation and media reporting and basically us. <laughs> so I think he's actually quite a good barrier to that. And more perhaps just as importantly, he, he is getting the best out of Charles Leclerc and he's making Leclerc buy into that project again. So these are a bunch of really good sort of broader foundational elements to, to the organisation. The big question is with the significant changes we're expecting from that car this year, similar to Mercedes, is Ferrari going to strike the right balance? The same. This is the same question with Mercedes. Are all those ingredients going to come together? And is the changing car concept, and Fred absolutely hates that word as well, actually going to result in a title challenger? It. I think that is actually now the big unknown. Whereas what I probably would have said 12 months ago is that Ferrari has quite a lot of other stuff that they need to do better and get on top of. And I'm seeing signs of, of that happening under Vasseur. And with the changes that have sort of been implemented Te- on the technical side, just in terms of sheer outright technical firepower, I think we're at least a year away from Ferrari being right at the top and being on that path to to glory because they've got people people joining, but they're still not going to be at full strength for probably another year. Yeah, I don't think I don't think they can produce a title challenger this year because I don't think anybody's going to. I think the the best we can hope for, and we should stress this is because we want, this is looking at it as a neutral. We don't have favourites or unfavourites. We just want, we want more teams fighting for the wins. We want the wins shared around. I still expect Red Bull to end up with commanding championship victories, but I want to see these two teams in particular, Ferrari and Mercedes, finally get it together. I, so I don't think Ferrari can win a championship next year or fight for one, but I, I do, I kind of feel like Scott did about Mercedes a year ago, where I've, I've got the faith and, and it's based on the kind of the last third of the 2023 season, just from Monza onwards. And I might've just been getting duped by everything they were saying, but 
I just felt like you could have more faith in what they were saying than you could in the first part of the year. And I, I really like Fred. I, I dealt with him in the junior ranks over a decade ago, really now. Um, and I was surprised and disappointed at the beginning where things weren't going well because he inherited a bit of a mess. And he just kind of took the uh, took the route of, nope, just say it's all fine. Or, yep, don't worry, we know what we're doing. And there were a few times where it looked like he was trying too hard to toe the party line. I thought, this isn't very Fred. And if this is what Ferrari's done to him, then I don't think it's going to work. But he grew into his shoes, his, his Maranello fitted shoes. And he came across with a lot more conviction as the year went on. The whole team did. And it was backed up by what felt like tangible change on track as well. Not only did they seem to make the car better, but being able to to bring the car back into a window where Leclerc could get the best out of it. I think that's significant. So much of what we said about Red Bull is the fact that Red Bull does a great job of making sure it's a car that Max Verstappen, as its best, fastest driver, can get the most out of it. I think as great as Carlos Sainz is and as good a job as he does there, Ferrari's Ferrari's absolute peaks are going to come from the car with a number 16 on it. So the fact that they were able to start to turn that around before the end of last year gives me some faith as well. So, yeah, this is probably the most upbeat I've felt about Ferrari for quite a few years. One of the things I found with Vasseur across 2023, because I, I, I understand where that kind of hesitance comes from, Glenn, in terms of that or the, the little bit of doubt about what Fred's Ferrari actually looks like and you don't really think it looks like very much in the first few months of of 23, is that there was there, I think there was an awful lot of feeling out the situation and just making sure he had time to, to, to work a few things out because the first half of the year, Fred was at his at his best when he was talking in a broader sense, when he was sort of looking at, when he was talking about culture, when he was talking about um, the performance potential of of the car and and seeing what they could maximise from it over the course of the year and, and, and that kind of stuff. It, it, there was a lot in the first few months of last year, there were very few specific details about We've got this specific thing wrong. These are the things we're going to do to address it. We've got this specific problem at the factory and this is what we're going to do to address it. He, he, I think as early as Jeddah, which was the second round, he was already starting to open up a little bit more about the things that weren't going right. But there did seem, it definitely came across as a little bit of resistance to sort of publicly talking about issues and how we'd fix them. But I think in an F1 context... That's kind of been Vasseur's strategy in general. He doesn't do a lot of talking. He prefers to actually just do stuff behind the scenes. And I think he's always been that way. Yeah. And and the second half of the year, the way that played out, that's again kind of repeating myself a little bit and also a bit of what you said. But that's what gives me the confidence because it's like, okay, Fred just did stuff and it actually made an impact. And he he even got to Abu Dhabi and he was saying like that doesn't really mean have changed much or anything you know he knows that it wasn't a one year that's it fixed everything it's still a team in transition and there's a lot there's a lot of work that does need to be done there still but he just seems to have put together a project that is actually internally and also by the sounds of it us externally actually do buy into and think that there is something here that is more detailed beyond the ah this will be all right the car's quick it will sort itself out the next one, Glenn. Could Oscar Piastri wrest control of McLaren? I should stress from Lando Norris as driver rather than <laughs> usurping Andrea Stella or something. Oh, you've uh, you've <laughs> robbed me of my chance to be a smart ass there. Um, I'm sure you'll well, find a way. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll bin my answer then about what I think of his capabilities as team boss. Um, let's talk about the driver lineup. I don't think he should, and that's more because I think if Norris is as good as everybody, including a lot of us, say he is, then Piastri shouldn't be able to do that. Not certainly not in year two. I think he'll be Piastri will be better. I think he needs to he needs to show that he's learned something about managing race pace and managing tires and and, and that sort of thing. It's going to be really interesting, and I do think he's going to push Norris really hard, and that's going to be good for Norris because 
it'd be very easy if you stay in the same team for a long time and you've always got the measure of your teammates and it's not a team that is out and out fighting for wins and championships, you might just get a little bit comfortable. So I think it's probably very well timed for Lando to have a teammate like this. I think he should be up to the challenge. And I think they're, they're going to be a phenomenal pairing this year. So if the car's good, they are both going to be causing a lot of problems for the teams that we've been talking about already. I think the, the interesting thing here is that it could be one of those ones, Scott, couldn't it, that there isn't necessarily any victor in this. Everyone always thinks one driver wins, one driver loses. But we know how good Norris is and we've seen how good Piastri already is but could be. So I guess that's the fascinating dynamic, isn't it? Yes, I think that's part of it. But I think there is a second part of this question, which is, will Norris want to stay at McLaren? And I think that is a key question that gets resolved in 2024. It might get resolved very, very early. It might get resolved towards the end. It might spill into 25, but 24 will be the foundation of the resolution because 2023 was absolutely critical for McLaren just realigning itself with Norris's own trajectory. There, there, there was a problem developing there, which was that just as McLaren was starting to fade and look less convincing than at any point during Norris's career that it would get to the front in Formula 1, Norris was very, very clearly ready to fight at the front in Formula 1. Norris is under, under contract until the end of 2025. But his desire to leave would only have grown, his frustration would only have grown had 2023 carried on the way it started in those first eight races or so, which were really, really frustrating and, and uh, frustrating and, and tough to put up with. So if we take it at face value, what Norris has said, what Zach Brown has said, Andrea Stella has said, that relationship is really strong and probably a lot stronger than it had any right to be in the first couple of months of 23. So Norris and McLaren are on a path again towards another renewal and a longer term contract. But if McLaren takes a step back again in 2024, if Piastri does particularly well and puts Norris under pressure, if something changes elsewhere, like Daniel Ricciardo has a mega target Alpha Tauri, Yuki Tsunoda continues to be someone Red Bull's got no interest in, and Sergio Perez is for the exit door at Red Bull Racing in t- uh, after 24. Red Bull will make another effort to sign Norris. And at that point, Norris might be moved to think, actually, has have I given McLaren all of the time and patience and everything that I need to give them? And if any situation like that emerges, whether Norris is definitely for the exit door, possibly for the exit door, having his head turned, whatever, that's where Piastri can come in and rest control as well. Because why would McLaren put everything behind Norris if they think there is a good or even decent chance of losing him at the end of 25 when Piastri is signed up for 26, is in in a different phase of his career. And not to say that Norris is disloyal in any way, but the the ingredients for Piastri's loyalty to continue, they're, they're, they're kind of already there. Whereas McLaren needs to do a little bit more convincing to keep Norris on board longer term. This is a conversation for another podcast but very quickly, I, I don't understand the the Norris Red Bull links and the, the Red Bull... The intro, I know they've, they've spoken well about him. I don't understand why he's the sort of driver they'd look for unless they don't think Max is long for for F1. If they, if they think Max is going to go, then you get Lando in early and he's kind of there and you put up with maybe having two drivers who are a bit too equal for their liking. If they think Max is going to stick around for a long time... I just think they're going to want to find another number two and want a more reliable number two than Perez. But that's a discussion for another time. I wanted to pick up on something we said earlier that you don't always have to have a loser in a teammate battle. In this McLaren battle, I think Piastri won't lose um, as long as he makes some progress. So if, if, if Lando still beats Piastri, but Piastri is better, that's good. Everyone looks good. Everyone's happy. If Piastri beats Norris or gets ahead of Norris, then I do think Norris loses. I think his his reputation that has only climbed during his time in F1 will face its first dip and then there will be questions and actually then maybe he would be ideal for Red Bull as a number two if they decide that he's not quite at the level of his current McLaren teammates. So I think there is some risk for Norris, but I suspect that it will just sharpen him up and, and make him deliver consistently at a high level. There's also a need for him to show that some of the problems he had in the final phase of 2023 were more car-related than driver-related because there were too many qualifying mistakes. He he admitted it. He was very harsh 
on himself and maybe overly harsh on some occasions but perfectly reasonably harsh on on, on others he needs to he needs to tidy that up and the the progress that McLaren makes of its car could go a long way to resolving that because if the car is clearly a more consistent compliant machine in qualifying much less so in the race it's it's in qualifying when it's on a knife edge that the problems arise Piastri because that's where he absolutely excelled in his rookie season was qualifying Piastri will expose any lingering Norris weakness if that car isn't the problem anymore let's say it was the main factor towards the end of 23 with Norris's rate of mistakes Piastri ha- is is good enough and fast enough to show when Norris isn't getting the most out of a consistently good car. So I think there is also a little bit of pressure there for Norris to just just, just tidy up that lip. If he's got any rough edges, it's those qualifying mistakes. They might not be his fault, but we'll hopefully find out in 24 whether he's got on top of the stuff that he's contributing to. And the more competitive the McLaren is, the more intense that battle between those two will be. So it could be a really, really exciting storyline if the McLaren is able to fight for race wins on a regular basis. Let's move on now to question five, Scott. Is Aston Martin the real deal? Yeah, it, this is a very, very important year for for, for Aston Martin as, as a whole. The, there was the big step, obviously, for the start of 2023, which was... Less, it, I, I think I said this quite a few times at the start of the year and then through the season. It was actually it was less of a shocking step as perhaps the outright results made it look because that that team had actually ended twenty two in a better position than it looked in the championship and in terms of I guess if you're looking at it a bit more casually because actually by the end of twenty twenty two it was quite regularly sniping for points. It was probably the it probably had the the fifth fastest car. But it didn't look like that. It was in in championship sense. I think it was seventh, and it had only sort of progressed into seventh. So it it wasn't like a blockbuster. Oh yeah, this it didn't look on the surface like this is a team ready to make a massive leap. They walked what through it, an open door as well, didn't they? Left by yeah, ex- Mercedes and Ferrari. Exactly. So what you had was a team that was actually really by the end of twenty two, probably the fifth best team in F one or the fifth best car. Then at the start of twenty three, two and well three of the teams ahead of it drop the ball in some way. One, because it's Alpine, and two, because Ferrari and Mercedes just didn't do as competitive a job. So there was an opportunity there, a bit of low-hanging fruit for Aston Martin to make a a, a very good step, but not a totally transformative, dramatic one, but the results were transformative and dramatic. Then it's not going to have the opportunity to do that again for 24, or it shouldn't, unless the answers to the questions we've asked before this are uh, can Mercedes get its car concept right absolutely not is Vasilis Ferrari on the path to glory absolutely not could Piastri rest control of McLaren no because it's going to implode that's the only way that Aston makes another massive step from season end to to season start but what's important I think for this year is to show something that I think you and I have talked about quite a lot Ed and I know that you've sort of arrowed in on this as something to prove is whether or not that technical structure and, and, and what they do can create good original ideas that it then develops through the season. Because it's kind of one thing to have almost cherry-picked a few of the best ideas elsewhere and then done your best uh, initial go at, at, at consolidating all of that and improving it in your own way. But I'm a little bit worried by the lack of progress that they made relative to rivals in, in, in 23. And Ed, I'm, I'm forgetting how you often phrase it. But that feels like the biggest question mark for me. It's that kind of original ideas and actually showing the flexing the technical muscles, so to speak. Yeah, they've got to show they can self-sustain their progression with their own development work, their own ideas, their own concept drives, etc. And it's that this is the test of what the team can do, which is why I think the 24 car is a, a huge, huge test. And actually, I think it's the toughest question on this list that we're talking about today to actually come up with an answer to because we haven't yet seen the evidence. The evidence will be in the 24 Aston Martin. We can't really predict because that could be a car that's right up there or it could be a car that regresses further and is is messing around fighting for the sort of back half of the grid if things go wrong. It's a different side of the same coin with the other teams. With the other teams, we're asking them to prove to us that they do finally understand what they've done wrong and where they need to go. With Aston Martin, we're asking him to prove that they do understand where to take what they did in 2023. So there's still a level of, we're not certain that they know exactly what the next steps are, 
it's kind of, okay, you did a really good job to get to this point. Do you know why you got there? And do you know where the direction is from here? So it's, it's, this, it's you can bundle it into the same question about, do you really understand what's going on here? It just so happens that unlike the other big teams, Aston Martin at least got to this stage before they did. The one thing that did encourage me about their 2023, the second half of the season, was the way they kind of unpicked the problems that they'd almost meandered into in the second half of the year. And OK, the, the, the Brazil qualifying result and race result was a bit of an outlier compared to the races that followed, but it was a bit more convincingly the fifth best team again in this at the end at the end of the year I mean obviously Alpha Tauri and Alpine had had their moments but it just felt like Aston Martin had I, f- I feared that it was on a trajectory that had it fading out of that even points by the end of the year like a real reverse of the 2022 trajectory that was what was concerning me but it, it did feel like they started to unpick that quite effectively and when you consider that one of their targets was to to, to undo some of the negative characteristics that had caught Lance Stroll out in particular and Stroll's form over those final races, while not stunning and still too weak in qualifying apart from in Brazil, it was better. It was a lot more like what we saw in the first few races of the year. Ironically, when Lance was at his weakest physically, um, and that sort of again suggested, okay, well, you had a, you had a specific, specific goal with the car here and you seem to have achieved it because Stroll's form changed quite dramatically. So a bit of encouragement from that. And and then obviously this, another part of the subsection of the question entirely is what happens with the drivers. Because I don't think there was any doubt after 23 that Alonso is still in a more than good enough position to lead a team like this and to deliver when the results are there. That the jury is very much still out on 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 Lance. I think... There's a, I think there's just about enough evidence for you to say that he he could do he could do some good results. Like he's he's done enough he's done enough sort of solid work with a few flashes here and there to know that if that car is to his liking and is very competitive, Stroll's not going to be absolutely nowhere. He's not going to be getting knocked out in Q1 in a car that is you know top five on the grid week in week out or anything like that. He's clearly not a hopeless Grand Prix driver, but he's not on Alonso's level. And is he really good enough if Aston Martin proves it is the real deal and is in a position to to fight for second, third or fourth in the championship? Is Stroll going to be there supporting Alonso and making a legitimate, proper contribution to that? that again, I, I think there's a, there's a big question mark against it. Yeah, and I think, again, Aston Martin is the team that has probably the widest range of possible outcomes in terms of its competitiveness this year, which is makes it what makes it so interesting. The hope is that it is strong because, again, that's a team that has good quality people. They've invested in a lot of the right places. So the ingredients should be there. It's really a question of whether it coheres properly and fully. It's done. It's done some of that, as was shown last year. But whether last year was a good intermediate step to better things in which case it was a good year or whether it was a a bit of a a one-off caused by a confluence of circumstances and they regress in which case uh, in which case last year was a bad year is the big question so yeah lots to unravel about Aston Martin and it's going to take the car on track for us to do that let's move on to our final set of questions now we're kind of working our way down the grid a bit Glenn is there any point in Alpine? The most disrespectful of the questions on here, but perhaps not with not without good reason, given its uh, static form of the past half decade or so. Yeah, I could just say no, and then we'll move on and save ourselves some time. Uh, but I would like to explain slightly why this is beyond the team's flatlining performance or somewhat flatlining performance. And I think that since this team became Alpine, nobody... As far as I can tell from like the engagement we can see from our audience, nobody cares about this team as Alpine. Nobody knows what Alpine is. Um, we spent the first six months uh, having fans telling us that we were wrong for not saying Alpine. Um, so that there's nothing, there's nothing there for people to care about. So if the team stays in the midfield, people don't don't want to read about it. They don't want to watch videos about it. They probably won't listen to a, po- a full podcast about the team. The, the team. Even though you, it's very easy to forget, this is still a works F1 team. And when it was called Renault, that's, that's a big name with um, wider 
automotive recognition, but also massive F1 history. Alpine, it just sounds like a sponsor to most people. So I get what probably why they did it was it was a way of keeping the Renault group in F1 and oh we'll use it to promote this new this well, I was gonna say new brand. Alpine's been around for decades, this brand that we want to reinvigorate. But it has created a situation coupled with um their performances and with a, a driver lineup that's solid but unspectacular, it has made them a bit anonymous in the middle of the grid. And like I say, that's for more reasons than purely just performance. The 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 logic behind the the, the Alpine free brand gave the team a really really nice like basement level of what would be a success in formula one because a brand like renault doesn't get that much out of being the fifth sixth best team in in formula one but a nothing brand like alpine still gets enormous marketing benefits just by being in f1 so almost just just by existing and giving the team that platform or giving the brand that platform has value that renault just doesn't get in 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 the same way that that was great because that was a there was a really sensible as you almost as you alluded to glenn almost like future proofing of the renault group's participation in formula one because they would get so much more out of it in a relative sense by having alpine there the problem is that seems to have just translated entirely into renault's attitude towards the team's performance which is just well we're here and we're getting something out of just being here so why would we put more money in why would we put the right effort in why would we have the priorities in the right order to actually make a success of this team and I think we've said a, quite a few times now that organization now as Alpine I don't I didn't feel this way about it when it was still Renault but that organization right now is a marketing exercise with a racing team attached to it it's not the other way around and I sort of asked Alonso about this at the end of the 2023 season and said there's got to be very different at Aston Martin because that is very much, you know, there's a huge marketing element around that huge commercial element, you know, really, really leaning on the, the brand and um, business to business relationships with various partners and stuff like this, but there's not, so, so there's this whole potential commercial circus around Aston Martin, but it's a racing team at heart. It's a, it's a, it's a team, it's a program with serious ambition and a fairly logical intended path to, to get that Alpine and, Renault don't don't have that at all so you ask is there any point in the team yes there is from a commercial sense but competitively from a performance level less of a point than ever and it it frustrates me because there are really good people within that organization and Enstones are uh got a fantastic track record across multiple iterations and I'm sure that the people at Viri that do the engine, that they're obviously not no hopers. There's loads of loads of effort and talent and ideas there, but you just have an organization behind it that just doesn't to me, and I think actually Pat Fry might have said something like this at the end of twenty three as he's now gone to, to Williams from Alpine. There's no motivation, no desire or push from, from the owner really to be anything more than the fourth or best fifth best team in Formula One because well, they get everything they need to out of F1 by being at that level. So why would why aim higher? Why make it harder for yourself? Why make it more expensive? That and it's not just us asking if there's any point. It's kind of feels like Renault's asking that. Is there any point in being anything more than Alpine? Ultimately, as we talked about before, the ownership has has often been a question mark when it comes to run no owned F1 teams. The engine projects generally have done pretty well when they've certainly when they've been standalone. Obviously the turbo hybrid era hasn't been brilliant necessarily for for Renault and that's been going on a while now. So perhaps you could say in more recent years that's questionable as well. But yeah, it just comes down to is that team being given the best opportunity? Because that's one of the things that Pat Fry said when he was talking about why he left. He said that he didn't really feel that Otmar Safnauer had been given much of a chance to uh, to take things on. And, and his focus was firmly on the ownership in terms of that not giving the impression that it had the genuine ambition to move better than fourth. And then, of course, last year they finished sixth. And not just sixth, but Alpine was so profoundly six so they weren't in that battle at the back with the four teams they weren't anywhere near the top five they were just this very 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 no man's landy kind of six and that's that's pretty poor and 
while there were some what I'd call very gentle positives after the change they had mid-season, they slightly upped their yield in terms of points per race and that kind of thing. There were some gently positive things about the way the team was operating trackside and uh, Bruno Faman, the interim team boss, who incidentally seems like he might be becoming less of an interim team boss and might be there for a while in terms of running the team, said that he, he felt that the, the upgrade that they rushed through for Las Vegas to make it more competitive there than it was in Monza was a big tangible benefit of pushing on and being a bit more aggressive. But these are all, you know, that they're, they're sort of tentative green shoots rather than signs of overwhelming progress. So that, that's the thing I want to see, something something more convincing than just sort of these little ups and downs bobbing in the midfield one day they're fourth one year they're sixth one year they're fifth it all amounts to much the same thing it's just not really going anywhere even though a lot of the ingredients are there one of the things i would just to really sort of summarize the issue that i have with it is back to back effectively press releases from the organization in mid-december one came the day before the other first you had an announcement that davide brivio was finally leaving. And there, I can guarantee there has to be some people listening to this podcast now that had no idea Brivio was still there after his slightly curious but left field and kind of brilliant, in a way, switch from the world of MotoGP. Um, anonymous three-year stint, sidelined after 12 months, but really he'd been sidelined much earlier than that. And the man that was hired to be the head of trackside operations, effectively, the, or the trackside leader as the racing director ended up being in this absolutely nebulous um, racing expansion projects role that sort of put him in charge of the Alpine Academy, but he wasn't really, it was just, it was nonsense. And so they announced fair, you know, it wasn't totally perfunctory as a, as a statement, but they announced his departure. The next morning, there's this big press release about Zinedine bloody Zidane welcoming Alpine in Madrid and posing for photos because he's an Alpine ambassador for, God, for absolute, for, I, they're very, very proud of it and they're very excited about it. But as far as I can tell, I, I don't see how, I don't see why a serious F1 team or operation need, needs that affiliation. So there's lots of photos. He poses with the drivers, he poses with Alpine Academy members, he poses next to Alpine cars and stuff like this and does, takes them on a tour and they play a little game of football and that kind of thing. It's all very nice, but it's pure. Renault Group. It's pure Alpine F1 in that it's all style, no substance. And that, to me, that juxtaposition, really good person who you got nowhere near getting the most out of, has left. The next day, big song and dance about this pointless, big money, big name ambassador showcasing that. Like that's their priority, and that that's why I just have. Whatever faith I have on the Enstone side, really good people in the organisation, very side, whatever, that is that attitude is what will keep holding that back. And I think we will see that again. 2024 might be one of the years where they have a nice little upward tick in their trajectory, but they won't go any further than being probably the fourth best team and they'll probably come tumbling down fairly soon after. You mentioned, Ed, I think, that um, they were a, a no man's land sixth. That's last in class for a team like this. You know, in 2023, the four teams behind were in their own mini battle to not be last. So if you if you're if you're a team as big as as Alp, I nearly called them Renault. If you're a team as big as Alpine is, if you are Renault's works team and you're sixth and those are the only teams you're beating, you're last in class. So that's a bad year. I wouldn't even say they're last in class because I, I think they fell out of that class. They're adrift of the class. Yeah, they're in their own little B class. There's an A class and a C class and there's just the Alpine class on its own. Run, hey, ask, winning a class of one is still a win. Well, that's true. There'll be plenty of pot hunters in motorsport who will tell you that. But although <laughs> although there was a brief spell of races when Aston Martin kind of dropped into the Alpine battle, it was yeah, a very lonely season for, uh, for Alpine. I, I hope there's reasons to be more positive that, for, the, for this team than we see, than we're saying here. I really do, but yeah, that they need to show something, and I think we touched on the the areas that that are holding it back, and it's not necessarily the actual nuts and bolts of the team. As such, let's move on now to our seventh question, Scott. Will Sauber be any less pointless? <laughs> it's like variation. The questions are getting more and more brutal, aren't they? <laughs> you can tell Ed just like lost. Ed just he he started this podcast being the one that was look being the glass half full look at 2024. It was, but it feels like at some, when this podcast outline was being drafted, 
Ed was just like running out of enthusiasm for 2024 already. Or no, may- question eight, he's going to resign. <laughs> or maybe it's just as a little bit of a giveaway to the fact that we might not be recording this in the in the early minutes of 2024. Maybe the m- maybe 2023 had just started to take its toll a little bit too much on Ed as he got down to the um, the, the the tuggers of the of the group I, I, feel- I, I deny that allegation strongly Scott what just happened is I, I got further into the New Year's Eve revelries while writing obviously it took a little <laughs> bit of time and yeah the, the questions just gradually got a bit more Larry so this is the question that you write at about quarter to midnight in a weather spoon <laughs> I'm not sure it was quite that desperate <laughs> um, anyway right so speaking of desperate let's talk about Salba um, <laughs> obviously it's um, it's no longer the faux manufacturer that was Alfa Romeo um, and it's in this kind of holding phase now before it becomes Audi in 2026 it honestly this is going to be a bit of a treading water for a year or two and I'm sure the team will say that's not the case that and and to a degree it won't be behind the scenes there's going to be really really important work going on to get ready for 26 on track there's going to be really important work there as well because they need to start showing improvements and actually making progress there's been a little bit of noise about recognizing that they ultimately had they were one of the teams that got the concept wrong and had to address that quite substantially in the form of a brand new car for 2024 rather than you know evolve it through the year and then try to kick on so potentially that there is scope here for a reasonable step straight out the blocks in 2024 because a lot of the car I suspect will change but based on based on its recent track record, based on the fact that it's still in that kind of transitional phase to become Audi's works team, and even though elements of the facilities are are fantastic, there's still a fairly small organisation, and James Keyes arrived, obviously he had issues in terms of trying to make McLaren what exactly what Sal was trying to become, and, and lost his job there. He's been in their second half of 23, and started to get his feet under the table but it just feels it feels like it's at least a year too soon to start to see what this organization might become so I don't have hugely high hopes for it I'm fascinated to see how Audi feels about what you described there is going to be a very difficult very odd potentially anonymous couple of years before this team becomes full-on Audi are they willing to write it off on track because they're doing they believe they're doing all the right things off track or does there come a point particularly within boardrooms and that sort of thing where if it's going really wrong if Sauber becomes rooted to the bottom of the championship because those teams it's battling with get their act together will there be people going well what have we bought here what are we buying into we've bought this team and it's getting progressively worse since we bought it will that then mean that there's Audi pressure to get a bit more involved unofficially to turn things around before they come in in 2026. I have very little faith in Sauber at the moment, unfortunately, because they looked good at the start of this rule set because they had, what, the only car that was at or close to the weight limit? And it really, as far as as far as really matters, it's just been a gradual decline since then as everyone else has got their act together and very, very little by the way of real shoots of progress. So, I'm just I'm fascinated about how Audi's going to feel about that because 2026 is still a very long way away. The uh, I guess the glass half full way of looking at that is that um, Audi's if it's if its team gradually gets worse in this period, then Audi's going to look mega if it comes in in 2026 and even and even sets it up as the fourth or fifth team because it's going to look like an absolute it'll be the anti Mercedes, the opposite of Mercedes where you buy a title winning team and suddenly turn it into what like the fourth or fifth team in Formula One at the at the first attempt. I have a suspicion that Sauber won't get that bad, and I have a suspicion. I also don't think Audi will do that good a job straight away. Yeah, I was about to say I'm not 100 percent convinced they'll be. That's why I think it's important that 24 is at least the start of seeing some progress because I think whatever you see in 26, even though you'll have the new engine and you will have a new rule set, a new new set of car rules to try and put all of the the, the, the fruits of the labour of the last few years into effect for a brand new set of regulations, it's an opportunity to make a big leap. I think this is the foundation, right? And I don't... It, it has to get to a good level, but it won't get to that level this year. That That's my concern. And ultimately, with its driver lineup. Why would you expect anything spectacular? I mean, Valtteri Bottas will probably have a few really nice headline-grabbing Saturdays and the odd great 
conversion of that into decent points on Sundays. And that's about as good as it will get from the drivers. Or am I being too harsh, Ed, given that this is obviously Sauber is a team that you have a soft spot for? Well, I think, you know, we, Bottas did produce some strong weekends last year, sometimes on fairly hopeless ones for the team. So it didn't show through that well. He can be a little bit erratic. Joe, in a quick enough car, can be a solid point scorer. So, yeah, it's, it's not a stunning lineup, but it, it, it could have some decent uh, decent peaks. But what I want to see from that team is just an improvement from what they did last year because it just wasn't enough. It was very erratic last year and they're not anywhere near maximising the potential of the team that they are right now. So that's the two things they need to do. They need to you know, expand the team, get more people in, improve the facilities, etc. But they also need to get better at maximising the performance potential they do have because those two things together are what will turn that team into the race-winning operation Audi wants it to be. Down the line... Let's move on to our final one now. Glenn, we're moving into the world of the driver market. Can Williams keep Alex Albon? Well, I'm glad your questions have calmed down. And it's not just, um, what's the point of Williams? Um, but I don't I don't think I have good news for them. I think if, uh, if Albon reproduces what we saw from him in 2023, I think he's going to outgrow Williams. And yes, Williams is hopefully going in the right direction. James Vowell's... Seems to be doing a really good job and has got grand plans. But the way I look at it is, can Alex Albon afford to wait for those grand plans to come to fruition? Probably not. And I don't think he should if the right offer comes along. What he has done to his reputation is phenomenal. So going to Williams, absolutely brilliant job. I don't necessarily think that's going to get him a top, top race winning car. You know, they're not, I don't think those teams are going to be fighting over him. But better midfield teams might be. And there's always you always get the odd unexpected vacancy when the driver market's a bit volatile. And I hope the driver market's more interesting than it was this winter when nothing happened. So I just think he will have better offers. And as much as we all love loyalty, this is a ruthless sport. And if Williams felt they could give, do better than Alex Albon, they would replace him. So if he can do better than Williams... I think he should go somewhere else. And I, I'd like I say, I, I just think that the timeline isn't going to quite line up. So I can't sit here and say that he should definitely ride the wave with Williams because I think that, that, that progress is going to be slow. Well, and also he's got to be aware of the passage of time, doesn't he? In terms of, he's not an old driver. As by we all do. Imagine. Exactly, exactly. But he's he's sort of entering F1 middle age now. So this next move he makes... It could be actually the biggest move he makes in terms of the financial uh, package he gets. It could be with he's going to be in a strong enough position in the driver market, probably. Particularly if he moves to an upward mobile team, upwardly mobile team rather than one that's established at the front, it could be a good long term contract as well. So he needs both to maximise his earning potential and his opportunity here because Williams's recovery is going to take quite a long time. He'll be able to be. He'll be able to form a firm judgment on it because he's on the inside. So he'll have a fair idea of how long it could take Williams to get up there. So he will know whether it's worth considering staying there. But he will also have to do what is best for his own career. Ultimately, he's given Williams, as of now, two extremely good years. He will probably have given them three extremely good years by the end of the current contract. So... Yeah, he he will have a high market value. And obviously, Scott, it's all part of what could be a quite volatile market, couldn't it, for 25? There's potential for there to be lots of changes. And Albon will be one of the central players in it. I can see him for quite a few months being linked to all sorts of opportunities while other chess pieces are being moved around. Yeah, it kind of... um, One of the things I've actually really enjoyed hearing from Albon at times over the last sort of 12 months or so is just how honest and blunt he has been about his age. And like he he sort of said, like, everyone calls me young, and but I'm not in an F1 driver sense. So he's not... I don't think he's in a... I'll give you a comparison. Bottas and Perez could conceivably have done their last proper deals in, in Formula One. They might have another deal in them, but they, they, neither of them have a lucrative deal left in, in their locker. I think they can extend their careers, but they don't have a big one. 
I think a driver like Carlos Sainz and maybe Albon's in the same bracket or a little bit of a slightly different one. But once you get a driver that's sort of coming to the end of their 20s and Sainz, I think, has a couple of years on on Albon. Sainz, I feel like, is looking at his his last big contract. Like, that's what I think Sainz wants to do. I think... Ideally, he'd do that with Ferrari now and get a three or four year deal, bank a load of cash, take him into his early 30s and then decide what to do from there. He, he, he's looking for something like that. Albon, I think, is trying to put himself in a position to get the first of those big deals, if that makes sense. The, the, the one that puts him back into much more of a prominent position in, um, in Formula 1. He's already re-established himself as a relevant and important player in the driver market, but in terms of the chance to get bigger results, the chance to get a bigger payday, that's what the next deal is about. And then there should be one after that as well. So this is a really important phase of of Albon's career and how that ties in with the others. Your you know your 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 f- career fading slightly older drivers like a Perez or 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 a Bottas, a, a Signs who's in a similar kind of situation but also trying to throw his weight around the potential retirement of big guns like Hamilton and and Alonso. There's an awful this is a very it's a very three-dimensional driver market which is the complete opposite as Glenn said of one where for the first time in history we're going to start a season with exactly the same driver lineup as, as we ended it. I would be st- I would be st- I would be stunned in 12 if in 12 months time we are looking ahead to the same grid yet again. Yeah, I don't think that'll be the case. For reference, Albon turns 28 in March and Sainz, who you're comparing him to, is 18 months older. So Ancient, the pair of them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But it, it is F1 middle-age and it's a short career and it's your job as a driver to make the most of it, especially as Albon hasn't exactly been raking it in for the past few years with uh, with Williams. He's making a decent living, certainly by uh, normal standards, but yeah, he's not setting himself up for life yet let's put it that way and he needs to with the next one and given he's been so close to F1 Oblivion when he was on the scrap heap as Red Bull Reserve he knows how important it is to make the most of that well hopefully we've managed to address the big questions going into the season it's very very hard to give any definitive answers but the next 12 months will answer them all we will know absolutely everything come this time next year so that's something to look forward to and of course the race f1 podcast will be with you every step of the way so thanks very much to scott and glenn for your insights head to the race.com don't forget the hyphen plenty to read there on the world of f1 check out our other podcasts including bring back v10s hosted by glenn freeman of course the new series of that starts on january the 4th with an episode all about the 1989 Japanese Grand Prix, the infamous clash between Alan Prost and Ayrton Senna. Also, there's the Race F1 Tech Show starring Gary Anderson, our MotoGP, IndyCar and Formula E podcasts as well. And also take a look at our YouTube channel, both long and short form videos there. We're very much looking forward to enjoying this year with you. So happy new year and stay with us for everything you need to know from the world of Formula One. The Athletic.